It's 3.45. I now call to order the meeting of the Building and Contracts Committee for Tuesday, February 19th. And we'll begin with a presentation on the cohorts program. Good afternoon, Mr. Burke. Good afternoon, Mrs. Hen, uh, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm bringing forward 14 cohorts today, so I thought it would be important to give you some information before we begin on those. Thank you. So a cohort is a group of permanent employees who begin and complete together an approved sequence of courses which are contracted for direct billing. Cohorts are planned to meet system needs. Cohorts benefit the employees and they benefit BCPS. BCPS pays the tuition for employees in cohorts through direct billing. Employees repay the tuition if they don't pass the course. Teachers are required to take graduate level courses to maintain their certifications, so cohorts support that requirement. Cohorts help BCPS respond to forecasted hiring needs and to grow employees in hard to hire content areas and leadership positions. The benefit of direct billing supports recruitment and retention. Not all of our surrounding school systems organize cohorts for their employees. The amount directly billed for each course in a cohort is equal to the amount of BCPS tuition reimbursement. The current rate is $300 per credit, up to nine credits. Cohort programs are approved by MSDE and MHEC. All employees may participate in cohorts. I'm sorry, all eligible employees may participate in cohorts. You are eligible if you belong to a bargaining unit that has tuition reimbursement as one of the negotiated benefits, and you haven't used up your yearly allowance for reimbursement. Participants must also meet the acceptance criteria for the university admissions process. We currently have 37 cohorts running, enrolling nearly 800 employees. Some cohorts are master's degree programs that take four years to complete, and some are certificate programs that take one or two years to complete. Oh, I'm gonna go back to that one. Our current cohorts coming before you tonight include educational leadership, literacy, we're trying to grow our pool of reading specialists, and you'll notice in each of those literacy cohorts, there's a component on dyslexia, um, because we've heard a lot from the public about that. Educational technology, school library media specialist, ESAW, math, and special education. And with that, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. McMillian? I want to be real honest. This is just confusing to me with, uh, I'm used to the credit reimbursement, where you took the class, you passed the class with a B or better, you did your paperwork, you got your $300 back, or whatever it was at the time that I was doing that. But how, like for the, for the first one, I think, the $225,000 or one of them to Goucher, how to, so explain the monetary side of that. Sure. When you see a $225,000 figure, what is, it's, I don't understand that. There are two ways to access tuition reimbursement. One is through just you going to a college, signing up for courses, and deciding what your master's is going to be. And in that way, you take the course, you pay for it up front, and then once you pass, you submit your, uh, your, Thank you. Your transcript, and then you get reimbursed. Cohorts are a little different in that we pay the bill up front for you, which makes it more um, interesting, and um, employees are more likely to go towards cohorts because they don't have that, have that out-of-pocket cost at the very beginning for the tuition. Um, we have, and there are two different ways to do it. You can go through the cohort process, or you can go off on your own and take a related to your content area master's degree program and get reimbursed the traditional way you just explained. Okay, and suppose uh, the, the money's not used, so 
You know, in this example, I think you're giving, you know, something about gouts or $225. Does that money come back to us? It does. This is just spending authority. We only pay the bill if the person went through the course. So we actually don't normally spend all of that money because just through natural attrition, uh, people leaving, you know, after three years or something happens in their life where they just can't complete the cohort, then we don't spend that money. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Ms. Rowe? So I noticed that in some of the contracts that we have for this, it talks about um, there's language that sounds like replacement or alternative to certification. Can you explain what that um, means? So teachers are required to take a certain level of master's courses to maintain their certificate. Um, and in Maryland, there are two options. You can get a master's degree or you can get something called a master's equivalency. And that would involve college level courses, um, some offered for continuing professional development credit through MSDE. You can get about 18% uh, 18 credits worth of a master's degree. That way, in order to maintain your certificate in Maryland, Maryland's kind of a rare uh, option for that opportunity. But so some people coming through already have a master's, but they want to become a reading specialist. So instead of going through a second master's degree, they can go through a certificate program, which doesn't require the full master's. So, ba so basically, if we, in doing this, is this helping us to create more and retain better specialists for things? Is this, tell, why, what's, I'm sure there's a rationale for why it's beneficial to the school system to do this. Can you? Sure. So uh, it absolutely is a response to hard to hire areas. So you'll see sp there's a special education one. There's ESOL because we're trying to grow our own um, through leadership succession within the organization. People, you know, that we'd like them to stay. They've been good teachers. We're not going to give them an opportunity to learn to be a special educator or an ESOL teacher or people that are interested in being assistant principals or principals need to go through the leadership track. So in that way, it really benefits the system because we can forecast what the need is, we can design the program, and then we can fill our own holes. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Offerman or Mr. Kuhn? Mr. Kuhn? So the cohorts that are offered, how are selections made to to join the cohort? They're self-selected. The teachers choose them themselves. They do have to meet the admissions criteria of the university, though. OK. And um, the other question I have uh, relates to how the selection of the actual um, colleges that you're working with was made. So we meet with all the colleges in the area that offer the coursework that's necessary based on the identified system needs and we let them submit uh, proposals. And then I review those pr proposals with the chief academic officer and the chief of human resources to see if they match our uh, identified needs. And then based on that, I also try uh, to maintain relationships with all of the universities that we have partnerships. So I try to put that into effect to, uh, to make sure uh, we maintain those relationships by making sure they have access to at least one of the cohorts if they've put a proposal in. So for example, the, the one associated with nursing that you have there, uh, I believe you, it, it highlights uh, Stevenson, yes. right, as a select, selecting one. Um, is there a reason why, because I know Towson has a nursing program also. Yeah, if I could be honest with you, Mr. Kuhn, Towson wasn't interested because they don't make enough money on cohorts. It's easier for them to make more money in just the regular program, so they didn't even submit a nursing proposal. Okay, because I saw that we selected Towson for another cohort. Um, yeah, I'd have to look through and, and see. I think they actually might even be one or two of them. Um, that was one that's the library media specialist one I know is the Towson one. It's probably the 16th time we've run that cohort. It's very successful. About 75% of our librarians have come through that program. 
So they make money on that cohort, but they're not interested in, in the other ones that you've... They weren't when we approached them about the nursing opportunity. They just, um, it's so hard to get in their regular bachelor's program, and they make so much money through that, they just weren't interested in branching off for, for our identified need. Okay. So I was trying to understand, and what struck me as I was looking through the documents provided, it usually when Mr. Saris is going through the contracts, it says like the number of bids, and then the number selected and or the survive. So it, it just looks like one. Yeah, this is a I little don't, different. It does, we don't really go through the bidding process. They submit proposals, which I guess is similar, um, but uh, it's not really a bidding process. They try to remain competitive with each, with each other. We make sure they understand what each, each other's rates are, but we pick them based on whether or not they've met the identified need. Uh, for instance, I mentioned before the literacy ones, we were really looking to make sure that dyslexia was mentioned in each of those proposals. So <coughs> under uh, 4-123 of the education article, cooperative administration of programs, this falls into a negotiated agreement with another public education agency, so uh, that is exempt from the bidding process to foster cooperation where there's an overlap in need between different public education agencies like Towson or ourselves or, and Goucher, et cetera. Um, so Goucher's a private college, correct? So how does that fall into this public thing that you just mentioned? Because they're not part of the state, well, any state agency or anything like that. They're public, so. they're open to the public. They are, uh, you know. So we don't delineate between, say, not Loyola. Between, not based on funding and endowments and that sort of thing. Yeah, it's a public institution of higher learning. Okay, all right. You know, my, my question and my basic premise would always be, hopefully there's competition for these programs so that we're getting the best you know, opportunity for our employees. Yeah, I assure you that's exactly what I look for, that their, their out-of-pocket cost remains as low as possible and that the program is of high quality. The cohort is, is a great incentive because when Mr. Burke negotiates the pricing, it's based around that $300 rate. So, you know, I've had staff that live in Thermont and they want to pursue a degree at Mount St. Mary's and they do that. They do it on their own, th that we give them a $300 per credit hour reimbursement and it may cost them $3,000 to take the course, but that's where they live, that's where they went to undergraduate school and so they select that option and they bear the difference between those rates on themselves, whereas in most cases, there's very little out of pocket because even with private institutions like Goucher, we're negotiating a rate that is very competitive and, and really would be cheaper if the, than if they approached that school on their own to do a self-guided course of study. Which also becomes, it's, again, it's a recruitment and retention tool as well. This is investing in our employees, investing in their professional learning. And so really it's about which university can meet um, the needs of our employees based on our priority areas. Our priority areas are ESOL, literacy, uh, special education. We have some in mathematics, technology, of course. So we, um, we need to make sure that we are partnering with those universities that are uh, best fit and best match um, for our employee needs. So I, I know that we wanted to give you a general overview um, of cohorts because I think this is the first batch, Mr. Burke. It is. I, I, I'll usually come back once a year around this time with my <laughs> group of cohorts for you. Right. And so there are quite a few um, because, of, of course, we do have quite a few professional staff. And so we wanted to give you a general overview of cohorts in general and um, what uh, the parameters are, what direct billing means, how it's a benefit to our employees, and then allow you to go through each of the contracts as well. Great, thank you, Mr. Burke. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. White, for that explanation. So. And good afternoon, Mr. Saris. Yeah. Uh, we have 14 of these cohort exhibits, items one through 14, and I can uh, read them into the record or 
yes. if that's what you prefer. We? Okay. Yes, please. Uh, the first item, LKO 90519, is uh, learning, cohort for learning technologies uh, specialist at McDaniel College. This is a new cooperative administration of programs cohort. Uh, in learning technologies, approval is requested for a two-year, three-month contract, and contract spending authority of ninety thousand okay. dollars. Any questions, Mr. Kuhn? So, how many people are we expecting or trying to educate here? Because it's not clear. Twenty. Most cohorts are for 20. The MAP cohorts you'll see today are for 30. The, which ones, I'm sorry? MAP, M-A-A-P-P. -P. Okay. It's an alternative certification program. Those cohorts are designed to support people who come in uh, without full certification. They get teaching jobs and then we get them through a program to get them uh, a full certificate. All right, so when I see each one of these, except for the map one. It'll be 20 people. It's 20 people we're talking yes, about. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next All right, item. next item, ARA 90719, Maryland Approved Alternative Preparation Program, MAP, for secondary education. This is a new cooperative administration of programs contract uh, for a cohort in pedagogy planning and classroom management. Approval is requested for a two-year, three-month contract and spending authority of $225,000 with Goucher College. Questions? Hearing none, next item. LKO 90419, Maryland approved alternative preparation program MAP for special education. This is a new cooperative administration of programs contract for cohort in special education. Approval is requested for a two-year, three-month contract and contract spending authority of $288,000 with Goucher College. Okay. Okay. Hearing no questions, next item. ARA 91319, Master of Arts in Leadership in Special Education Exceptionalities, Dyslexia, Dyscalculia, Dysgraphia Certificate. This is a new cooperative administration of programs contract for a cohort in exceptionalities. Approval is requested for a four-year, three-month con contract and contract spending authority of $216,000 with Notre Dame of Maryland University. Great. Okay, Mr. Kuhn. So this one has a term of four years and three months. Why is it different than the other ones? This is a Master's of Arts program, so it takes four years to get through the Master's program. If it's just a certificate program, it's usually one to two years to get through that program because it's the difference is between 15 and 30 to 36 uh, credits that you need to get through in each of the programs. All right, thanks. Sure. Thank you. Next item, please. ARA 91119, Master of Arts in Leadership in Teaching for ESOL. This is a new cooperative administration of programs contract for a cohort in leadership and teaching. Approval is requested for a four-year, three-month contract and contract spending authority of $216,000 with Notre Dame of Maryland University. Okay. So no questions? LKO 90219, Master of Arts in Leadership in Teaching, literary, Literacy Specialist, Coach with Special Education for Exceptionalities, Certificate, Dyslexia, Dyscalculia, Dysgraphia. This is a new cooperative administration of programs contract for a cohort in literacy and special education. Approval is requested for a four-year, three-month contract and spending authority of $216,000 with Notre Dame of Maryland University. Next item. Oh, Mr. Kuhn. So again, this is, this is just for 20 people? It is. So if we wanted to increase this to say, 100 or 300 people or 400 people, how would we do that? First, I'd have to find out if the university could support that number of students coming. Uh, I'm not sure they would be able to support with, with the number of instructors that they have available. Um, 
You want to help me answer that, George? I think well, some of it. Yeah, some of it is really about we'd have to increase the the amount of tuition reimbursement available. Mm -hmm. I have about four million dollars a year available. Um, so, what is the demand for for something like this? Do you just expect to get the twenty, or do you expect to get less or more? Or are you targeting specific schools and people? We're targeting specific areas of need more than we are st um, specific people and schools. Mm -hmm. um, we don't normally have trouble filling cohorts because they're such an attractive offer because of the monetary right. incentive. Right. Um, okay, thank you. Sure. And just if it's not n understood that in addition to the incentive, the financial incentive for the tuition subsidy, teachers also have a pay scale that increases with hours of education. So um, I think, are we on to item seven? Yes. Yeah, um, ARA. Ms. Rowe has a question. Oh, yeah. Um, is there anything within our policies that once someone acquires a degree, do they have to maintain in the school system employment for a certain amount of time? Or like, so for instance, could, could someone finish their degree here we've paid for and then immediately leave and go to another school system? Yes, they could. We don't have anything in our policy that um, makes people stay. And that would have to be negotiated as well with TAPCO. Okay. Um, ARA 910-19, Master of Education in Literacy Education, Culturally and Linguistically Diverse Populations. This is a new cooperative uh, administration of programs contract for cohort in literacy. Approval is requested for a three-year, six-month contract and spending authority of $180,000 with Loyola University of Maryland. Questions? Number eight, ARA 912-19, Master of Science in Instructional Technology, School Library Media. This is a new cooperative administration of programs contract for a cohort in instructional technology with a concentration in school library media. Approval is requested for a four-year, six-month contract and spending authority of $216,000 with Towson University. question in general. Have we considered expanding enrollment or would that be a benefit consideration to other employees of the system and has that been considered in terms of We do have retention? a program for non-certificated employees as well as the self-directed mm -hmm. program that Mr. Burke was talking about where teachers can choose their own course of study. But they are not so non um, certificated or not eligible for enrollment into we, we've had the cohort. Similar programs uh, for uh, CCBC for people to get their AA and then move on to their bachelor's degree. There just isn't one coming before you tonight, but it's pretty typical that you would see one. And we have a master's in business and a master's in information technology management, both for non designed towards non certificated staff. Okay, but there's no track for non-certificated then to enroll in some of the programs that we're seeing for certificated. Not currently, staff, not currently. Not currently tonight. But if I sent you the list of 37, you'd see there were some options on there. Okay, I'm thinking of career changers, and are we making as many opportunities available to them as possible? I'm just curious. We've greatly expanded for non-certificated. That program has been expanded. It also includes not just degree programs, but Community College of Baltimore County programs for certificates and, uh, you know, customer service skills, professional writing, and, and those types of programs that just, uh, they do add to an employee's uh, credentials, and in some cases, uh, with a, a, obtaining an AA degree, uh, some of the ESPBC and ask me employees are eligible for associated pay adjustments. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, number nine, LKO 906-19, Master of Science in Mathematics Education. This is a new cooperative administration of programs contract for a cohort in mathematics education. 
approval is requested for a four-year, three-month contract and spending authority of $216,000 with Towson University. Mr. Kuhn? Just a, just a general question about cohorts. You, so this is like a two year, this is a four year cohort, right? But <clears throat> you're, you're constantly starting new cohorts every year, correct? That's correct. Okay, good. Just and others are expiring every right. year. So we're, we track that so that we stay within our financial means. All right, thanks. Okay. Uh, number 10. ARA 90919, Master of Science in Nursing, Population-Based Care Coordination. This is a new cooperative administration of programs contract for cohort in nursing with a concentration in population-based care coordination. Approval is requested for a four-year, six-month contract and spending authority of $216,000 with Stevenson University. Okay. Yes, Mr. McMillian. I'm curious, would that be for teachers that want to become nurses? It, it is not. It's for current nurses that want to move on to get their master's degree. Okay. And not that I'm encouraging it, but is there a ceiling at, at where people stop getting reimbursed or stopped? No. In our not that I'm encouraging In, in our that. system, till your 35th year, you can still take courses and get tuition reimbursement. Okay, thanks. Sure. Mr. Kuhn? So, I believe that Stevenson offers three separate masters for nursing. Is there a reason why population-based care coordination was selected? Deb, would you like to come up and speak to that? The best, the easiest answer is it was the track that met the, that had the majority of courses that met the needs of our nurses. So they need, they do a lot of care management. We work a lot with teachers and doctors and parents and students to make sure that their health needs don't interfere with learning. And um, there is no master's in school nursing in Maryland. And so when I met with the university and met with the graduate program, we, we were picking and choosing the classes. The care coordination and management make, made the most sense. Great. I love simple answers. Thank you. Thank you. Number 11, LKO 90319, Master of Science in Transformational Educational Leadership. This is a cooperative administration of programs contract for a cohort in educational leadership. Approval is requested for a four-year, three-month contract and spending authority of $216,000 with Towson University. Are all programs that we enter into these arrangements with um, accredited? Yes. That is a I mean, they're MHEC approved, so they're accredited. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Ms. Rowe? I just want to know how transformational educational leadership differs from educational leadership. So the universities get to pick their own title. We don't really have any control over that, so they try to make them as flashy as possible, but sometimes it makes it confusing. Okay, next item, But the please. Administrator One certification is a standard uh, across the board requirement. Yeah, to become an assistant principal or a principal, you have to have an administrator one. Number 12, LKO 919, Postmasters Educational Leadership Administrator One. Uh, this is a new cooperative administration of programs contract for a cohort in educational leadership. Approval is requested for a two-year, six-month contract and spending authority of $126,000 with Goucher College. Mr. Kuhn? So, so the last one talked about a master's degree because right. that was 36 hours, and I see this is 21 graduate hours. But this just leads to a, cert a certification of administrator one. Right, so if you are already a reading specialist, you have a master's degree, right. but you'd like to become an assistant principal, you need the additional 21 credits to become an assistant principal. You don't need a full master's. So we try to make both options available to people, teachers that have 
the need for the full master's or people that already have a master's but would just like the certificate. All right, thanks. You're welcome. 13, LKO 901-19, preparation for the instruction of English learners. Uh, this is a new cooperative administration of programs contract for a cohort in English for speakers of other languages, ESOL. Approval is requested for a two-year, three-month contract and spending authority of 90000 with McDaniel College. Questions? Mr. Kuhn. So uh, maybe it's the title that's throwing me here. It's okay. Right. So it's saying preparation for the instruction of English learners. My understanding or thought process would we be we would be hiring people that would already have these skills if we're putting them in an ESOL environment. Yeah, so this is a certificate program, so this is probably best suited for a current teacher who would like to learn more about how to reach their students who don't speak English or who would like to become ESOL teachers. Okay, thanks. Thank okay. I think the last cohort, item number 14, ARA 908-19, Urban Educational Leadership Certificate Program. This is a new cooperative administration of programs contract for a cohort in urban educational leadership. Approval is requested for a two-year, three-month contract and spending authority of $81,000 with Morgan State University. Questions? No? Okay, that was our last cohort. Okay. I, thank you, Mr. Thank Burr. you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Jeffers. So the uh, next item, KSH 31519, 3D printers and associated supplies. This is a new competitively bid contract for the purchase of 3D printers and associated items selected by the offices of blended learning, career and technology education and fine arts, innovation and digital safety and science pre-K through 12 for schools and offices. Approval is requested for a five-year contract with one recommended bidder and contract spending authority of $400,000. Good afternoon, Ms. Shea. Hi, how are you? Good, yourself? Questions? Ms. Rowe? Um, approximately how many 3D printers and are we outfitting these in all the middle schools and high schools? So I think there are approximately 200 units uh, okay. in the system, um, and uh, they are uh, they are allocated based on the programs that require them. I think. Can I add to that? So we did at, um, purchase them for every elementary school. There are several different models, um, some of which are considered somewhat consumable, if you will, just because of the wear and tear. So this contract, every elementary school was purchased, what's called an up mini. Um, and it is also part of the text technical specifications for any new construction that we have those in our elementary and our middle school programs. Our high school specs are being updated. Um, so this contract allows for some of the replenishment or um, additional purchases, but is also in complement to an initial purchase that already had been made. Yes, Mr. Kuhn. So what grade levels would a child start interacting with the 3D printer? As early as kindergarten it could be. So in our elementary schools, most of the 3D printer interaction would come through maker learning. It also has been written in sometimes, um, you'll see in collaboration with our science. So for example, in third grade, the safe racers, some schools use their to participate in that science unit all the way up through in middle school, our um, PLTW and some of our CTE pathways, and then certainly in high school. The change would be in the elementary level, the students aren't directly doing the printing, they're doing the designing and problem solving and creating, um, but that responsibility then shifts as they get into more of our um, more advanced courses in the CTE pathways in middle school and then up through high school. We haven't used it in pre-K yet, but we could. <laughs> Okay, um, just to kind of follow on, sure. you said that you're updating the high school specifications mm -hmm. for this, but does this 
budget authority cover spending for high school? It would allow for that. So we tried to be somewhat generous, again, because um, it's not going to be one bulk purchase. We're trying to anticipate the needs it's not unusual they might have four or five so with the different models the office has collaborated to come up with an estimated spending authority um, because we're somewhat forecasting to see the needs so as that um, as those technical specifications are developed this would allow for that potential as well and how long do these printers last it depends so um, dr. Grubb shared with me the up mini which is the one that runs in the five to six hundred dollar range it probably has a lifespan around two to three years depending but we have some models that are like the up max which um, it depends on usage too so there's some variability in the different models but probably a safe assumption is around the two to three year mark and then the um, I'm not exactly sure who you contracted with I'm sorry but J29 is the vendor. Are you able to buy many different kinds of 3D printers through them? They're just like a reseller? Or? Yep. So there are two particular models that were part of this RFP, the two that I just described. Um, so this, it, we're not limited to that, but as of right now in the um, RFP process, they identified two particular models that we would be using, the Up Mini, and I think the other one is called the Up Max, but I can check in my notes in a second. Um, up Box Plus? Up Box, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so when you come up, this isn't going to constrain you to only buy those two printers going forward. No, so these, so part of what this contract was intending to do, though, is to have some um, consistency across programs because that makes it easier for support with schools when they're dealing with similar models. So um, I don't believe it's limited, but those are the two models that were a part of the response. Yeah, we have pricing on the two pieces of hardware plus the various components that uh, tend to be replaced, the, sp the spools of material, the extruders, the cleaning kits, and et cetera, all uh, priced for these two models that they've quoted. All right, great, thank you. Thank you. And that was my next question about the spools of material. If this yep. purchasing authority, um, how you've anticipated the use and it includes um, pricing for filament, the flex plates, the HEPA filters, et cetera, anything that would go within the use case of the 3D printers. I, I mean, it's our best estimate right. based on Material. past experience and the pricing that we obtained. I can imagine a lot of enthusiastic little people get, getting excited using this. They this do great, get very so. excited. You can see going through those spools of material pretty quickly. Well, and certainly it's one that in collaboration we'd be having to track as that expands in the offerings. But so this was, again, forecasting our best efforts. Great. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Next item. All right. Sirs? Next item is Thank 16. You, ARA 21419, Substitute Employee Management System. This is a new cooperative contract to provide a substitute employee management service system for the Division of Human Resources. Approval is requested for a three-year, four-month contract term with one recommended bidder and contract spending authority of $250,000. Thank you. Questions, committee members? Ms. Rowe? So I noticed there's one vendor requesting solicitation and one bid received. Is there a reason well, because we didn't it's have a, more? Yeah, it's a cooperative contract. Uh, we've used this product since 2004. We've upgraded it once, I think in 2010. And uh, because our current agreement is coming to an end, it was a 15-year agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to continue using the system. Uh, for at least the near term. So we uh, identified a Fairfax County Public Schools contract um, and uh, we've only presented uh, the, the, the one bid that they took when they uh, did their solicitation. So we didn't take multiple bids ourselves. So are there other types of software that do this and did you explore different options for feasibility and cost effectiveness, or is it just there's something about this that you like? Um, at this time, no, we did not. Um, essentially, um, this is what we've been using, and for right now, it's been um, serving our purposes. So um, we're still you know, open as we move into the future to explore other options, but at this time, um, this is able to meet our needs. 
Mr. McMillian? Mrs. Lowry, I, I'm uh, interested in how many substitutes does the system need in a given day, approximately? Mm -hmm. So um, on an average, um, if you see here, um, this particular system will call out for about 850 to 900 subs um, on a given day. It'll range and it is like a roller coaster throughout the year. There are certain times, as you can imagine, throughout the year where we're hit a little bit heavier than others um, and certain days of the week um, where we're hit a little bit heavier than others. There are also um, times when um, an absence is put in that you don't need a sub. Um, you could have um, a, a teacher that might have a light load on that particular day and that they only have one class and so a school will work out a way to cover that um, versus getting a sub, um, especially at the secondary level. Um, they have um, ways within the school to apply coverage. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Lowry, is this system um, hosted locally or is this a software as a service? It's a software as a service. That they provide. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Okay, no? next item 17, JMI 62416, Service Desk Software Solution. This contract modification will provide for the continued maintenance of software for a service de desk solution. Approval is requested to increase contract spending authority by $400,000, bringing revised total contract spending authority to $1.86 million with the awarded vendor approved by the board in July 2016. Meeting Mr. Corns. Yes, Mr. Kuhn. So it says that <clears throat> We're modifying this to increase the contract spending authority for the remainder of the initial contract term to accommodate annual licensing fees. Did the fees go up? So the, the initial contract spending authority was uh, around both licensure and also modification of the software to include other offices outside of DOIT. So I know that transportation, for example, uses this. Uh, we're working to build, bring on um, our facilities uh, so that there's a single experience for help desk. So the uh, initial spending authority was used to modify the software in order to build workflows for those departments as well, as well as some others. Okay, so we've customized the software now. Mm -hmm. And have we, ex it sounds like we've expanded the user base. Yeah, this, uh, this piece of software would be uh, accessible to every, every employee in the county based on uh, their need for it. I'm, I'm sorry, this is, this is help desk software, right? Mm -hmm. So don't people just call help desk or send a ticket in? This is the software that they send the ticket through. Right, but access to a ticketing system is usually run by the help desk. I, I'm curious as to... So, so the, the, I understand your question now. So all of our users uh, interface with the front end of this software. So they, they're the ones that are submitting tickets. Those workflows that we have uh, built and uh, the method that this software has been customized around is so that when you submit the ticket, it gets to the place it needs to go. So on the back end of this, we have multiple users in multiple uh, areas that would be, um, for lack of a better word, servicing whatever that request was. For example, when we uh, put Schoology in place, we modified the end grade workflow so that it now reflected Schoology and then crossed into a new department to uh, do the support for teachers when they were asking questions about how do I enter a grade or how do I average my finals or how do I input a, uh, an assignment for my students. So it sounds as if we've expanded the user base significantly and now our annual licensing is going to be more expensive going forward? The annual licensing really hasn't changed, but the spending authority was used in a different way to, ex to change to workflow. right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there aren't going to be any more asks for this contract period? Um, I, I can't foresee any. So there's no more customization going on? In our current... Um, we could always move forward with a customization based on whether or not funding was available, but um, we have uh, put a pause on any customizations to really um, kind of solidify our base with it to make sure that we're not expanding past our ability to support. All right, thanks. Thank you. 
So we're talking about a COTS application that's been customized for BCPS, or is this something that was built specifically for us? So the, uh, the back end of this whole product is uh, made by Sharewell. Mm -hmm. And so Sharewell, by design, is a, uh, basically a customization. So it was off the shelf, but um, their, whole, their whole business model is based around uh, customizing all the workflows for the entity that they're uh, providing the help desk for. And what types of ent entities? School districts? Uh, they've, size? they've been um, deployed in school districts. Uh, Mrs. Obenstein can probably help me a little bit better with some of the other uh, install bases when we put this in place. but. Um, Ms. Hen, this crosses both school systems as well as private sector. Um, do you have a? Sure. We, they have a lot of public um, government institutions that they provide support for, uh, as well as higher ed, and then also some public educational institutions. So a lot of it is um, really governmental organizations. They do a little bit of private industry, but a lot of it is governmental. Okay, and is this an on-premise or SaaS solution? Uh, the, this one we host on-premise. It's hosted on-premise. Mm -hmm. And have we looked at other SaaS solutions and do they offer something that seems to be the trend of um, software developers moving toward offering SaaS solutions? We, we actually did uh, when we did this contract and we continue to look at it. Sharewell offers a SaaS solution. Um, what we looked at was the cost benefit when we went forward with this and currently the most beneficial is on um, premise. But we always have the option free of charge to switch to a SaaS service with Sharewell at any given time when it makes the most sense for BCPS. And when you say free of service, would that include migra data migration? Yes. As well? Yes. Yep. Okay. And do we know how long they plan to continue to support the on prem version? Uh, there is no end in um, their roadmap. So at this point, I don't have an answer um, because they don't have an answer other than indefinitely. Okay. That's a good answer. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. McNallion. Mr. Corner, if I'm not mistaken, you mentioned that it's been customized for transportation. Uh, That's correct. Yep. Can you give me an example of that? Absolutely. So, do, you, do you want me to take this one? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's going to um, answer better okay, than me. I'm sorry. So, um, absolutely. The, so what we're trying to go for at BCPS is a common user experience for our end users. So when they actually go to enter a ticket, all of the fields look the same that they need to enter. Just the information around what they need to enter looks different. So for instance, transportation had a need to capture things like bus number or um, different types of service. Was it a um, bus stop request? Was it an accident? Was it um, a bus repair that needed to happen? And so the customization lives around um, those specialty pieces that fit in a certain piece of BCPS serves. So like a screen up top might look the same for everyone, but down below we can customize that to look and capture those fields a little bit differently for each office in BCPS. So transportation also had a requirement where we needed to capture parent information, and we don't capture parent information um, in DOI fields at this time, nor in the logistics fields we're working on for facilities. So that was another customization we had to make for transportation. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. No. Item 18, JBO 70518, screen printing and embroidery for apparel and accessories. This contract modification will provide for the continued purchase of screen printing and embroidery for apparel and accessories for schools and offices. Approval is requested to increase contract spending authority by $1 million, bringing the revised total contract spending authority of $1.1 million with seven uh, awarded vendors approved by the board in November 2017. Yes, Ms. Rowe. So going from $100,000 to $1,100,000 for screen printing and apparel? Seems like a lot. Like, So this was a first-time contract. And uh, most of the money, as you can see here, is, uh, is spent in the schools with student funds, not board <coughs> funds. And we became aware uh, that there was a need uh, to unify all of these uh, different vendors and take a contract to the board because we assumed that spending was probably more than $25,000 a year and it was something that we wanted uh, to approach in a comprehensive manner. So we did this RFP and this initial spending authority of $100,000 was our estimate for board funds. Uh, and as you can see here, we've spent 127000 slightly more than our original estimate. 
And now that we have a year's worth of experience under this contract and we've been tracking all the expenditures on a contract basis, uh, we see the total spending of $434,000 suggests that our original estimate needs to be revised, and that's what we're requesting here in this exhibit. So some of this $1 million is actually paid for by students. Most what it, what is it? Is it like gym clothes? What well, is this? so I'm gonna. It, it is gym uniforms, and I'm just. I have a, an assortment of things here, so that uh, we can see that there um, are spirit wear, uh, imprinted lanyards, T-shirts does seem to make up the majority, such as a T-shirt for Senior Day. Um, let's see here. We have homecoming. Uh, we have field day, we have um, departmental t-shirts for professional development, uh, but, you know, gym uniforms and spirit wear uh, does seem to be, to make up uh, Fit Friday, wellness, dance club, these are the kinds of things, volleyball tournament, uh, golf uniforms, nice. Um, so that is just some, those are some of the examples. Mr. McMillian. Before I retired, I sold gym suits. I was responsible for volleyball tournaments. I was responsible for buying golf uniforms. But, you know, I used the, for the gym suits, I used the proof vendor. We went that way, but there was never I don't know how, I don't understand how this plays into it because I always got that bill, I paid that bill from the money that was, that was collected from the, and deposited right. and all through the proper channels. But I, we never, we always paid that locally. So how is uh, this? It is paid out of the school budget or the school activity funds. So it's paid locally, but we have a, an umbrella agreement that for which we got pricing uh, competitive pricing by taking this wholesale approach that everybody can use. Uh, it helps us track spending and manage vendor performance, but it also, it still is paid individually at the school level. Okay, so if I had, you know, $3,200 came in from the sale of gym suits the first three weeks of school, so I deposited that money daily, making right. sure I did it the right way, <laughs> and then, and then when, uh, so when the check came due, I wrote the check, and then we, we, right. we paid the bill from right. the money that I deposited. Right, and the only difference is, is that when you got that invoice or paid that bill, uh, you might want to write a contract number on there so that when we're tallying up, aggregating all the expenses to figure out what size the contract should be in the future, we have a way of uh, accumulating the total spending under this contract. Okay, but and lastly, so the, the part that I don't understand is I'm collecting this money from the child when they came in, check or cash or whatever, so that money's coming in that way. Where's this other money? This is, the contract doesn't represent money. The contract rec represents purchasing authority that all of the schools and offices will use to acquire these materials. So the, the budget and the money that's involved here is already in every school budget and in every school's uh, school activity account. This doesn't take, this, it doesn't involve any additional money being added to our regular operations. Thank if you. If I may, uh, Mr. McMillian, good afternoon. Uh, Ms. Hen and members of the committee. Um, I, I, I just, uh, being the teacher, um, so, you know, I th I'll explain how I personally think about spending authority. A spending authority is asking permission to spend up to this amount of money. Where those funds come from, those funds may come from school budgets, they may come from um, office budgets, they may come from a lot of different places, but the authority is saying, I'm asking permission to spend up to this amount of money over this amount of time. Um, and asking for that permission is based on what our spending history has been. So I don't know if that perhaps clarifies, and I know that that's uh, probably a layman's interpretation. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Saris, but that's how I think about it. It's like if my my child came to me and said, "Mom, I want to spend a hundred dollars over the next year on these items," 
And I would have to say, is that a realistic estimate of what you anticipate doing or not? And then I would have to decide, do I give them permission to do that? And then what's their plan to earn the money to be able to actually have the money to spend? So that's kind of my layman's interpretation. So I, for whatever that's worth, I hope that helps. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Rowe? So I think I'm struggling with this in a similar way that Mr. McMillian is, but let me see. This spending authority contract, is the reason that we have to do this because just because we have to have a contract with, like this is how they become the approved vendor? We, we have do a contract this with them and like why are we going through this step? Because any spending over $25,000 must be approved by this board. <laughs> and so this is the vehicle by which we aggregate the expenses that need to be competitively bid and then approved by the board. So yeah. it's a financial and uh, procurement management process that we do here every you two You just weeks. want our permission to do what he said so kids can buy gym clothes? Yes. That's what this is? Yeah. Okay. Mr. Kuhn, and if we could keep it brief, we're 10 yeah, minutes over. Yeah, this will be brief. So this is just a vehicle to sit there and, and highlight some vendors and we're looking, and, and the key word is in aggregate, what you just said, in aggregate, not just what Rod spent on gym, gym right. clothes for that specific school, you're saying for the entire system. Right, and to, and to be cost effective and right. financially responsible to, uh, to put this uh, aggregate okay. need Thanks. and, and okay. market it to get pricing. Thank you. Before we move to the next item, I ask Ms. Howie to come forward, please, um, regarding legal advice we received during the committee meeting so that that advice can be shared with those here and those watching from home. Sure, members of the committee, um, at a certain point a few moments ago, seven members of the board uh, were seated at the board table. At that moment in time, the committee meeting would have become a board meeting and a board meeting that therefore was not announced. There was not an agenda for it. Uh, as a result, my, res my advice to uh, the vice chair was that you needed to have fewer than a uh, quorum of the board sit seated at a uh, board table. Thank you, Ms. Howie. And Mr. Sarah, next item? <laughs> or Mr. Dixit? I'm finally gonna get Mr. Dixit up here to... Good evening. Uh, item 19. I guess that's where we are, right? Yes. JBO 705-19 is for chiller replacement at McCormick Elementary School. Uh, the chiller and supporting air conditioning system has lived its useful life. And uh, this is part of the capital budget that board has already approved. We have five bidders. and. The lowest bidder has worked with us. The price is within budget, so we're requesting your approval. Thank you. Board members, questions? No, seeing that. Next item. Next item is JMI 606-19. It's a similar contract as the previous one. It's chiller replacement at Owings Mills Elementary School. Uh, this is part of the capital program that board has already approved. Uh, there were five bidders. The uh, lowest bidder has worked with us with satisfactory performance. And uh, the existing chillers have lived this useful life and they are due for replacement. So your approval is requested. Great. Thank you. <coughs> Next series of contracts. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of background information. Is for Colgate Elementary School. The board in the meeting of June 12th had approved one bid package for the site preparation and demolition of the old Colgate Elementary School. This is the batch of five packages that are for package 1A for general construction, 1B for testing and inspection, 2A for site work uh, and on-site utilities, uh, 4A for masonry and 15A for mechanical. 
This is for construction of Colgate Elementary School. Uh, the question was asked in one of the previous meetings if the construction is still going to take place. It is on schedule, and this is part of our construction effort. After these five packages, we'll have additional five packages in March 5th meeting for the other trades, and then another package in May 7th meeting. So with that, we request your approval of five, five packages, and I guess for the sake of record, I'll go through the contract number. Mr. Dixit, unless my committee members oppose, I would think for the sake of time, we okay. can ask questions of these as a group and vote to move them forward. Ms. Rowe? So thank you for getting the answer to that question, that this will move forward. Um, I just want to say I am so grateful to see these contracts happening because this is the oldest school in the system. And as a community member, three years ago, I started advocating for this school to get rebuilt. So this feels good to me. Okay. Yes, Mr. McMillian. I've been past this site a couple times just in driving around, and it's kind of difficult to see what's going on. Can you, w w has the building been raised? Has the, yes, the demolition is complete. Uh, the site is being prepared for the new school, and these are some of the first set of contracts. And like I've said to you before, I'd love to, you know, and I don't want a dog and pony show around these sites, but I'd love to go to one of these construction sites with you. Uh, Thank you. One, once we have something to see there, uh, we'll invite you. You can come uh, with the blessing of superintendent, I guess. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Any you. other questions? Seeing none, do I have a motion to forward items I-1 through I-25 to the board for full approval? So moved. Is there a second? Okay, all in favor? Okay, with that, we're adjourned. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you.